for the National Hookup of Black Women. This morning's forum is being put on by the National Hookup of Black Women, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or NAACP, and ABBA, the African American Business Association, the three of us in partnership. We are all three 501c3 organizations, so we are not endorsing any candidates in any races. What we are doing is providing a forum so that people who want to can learn about the candidates and have an opportunity to talk to them firsthand so they can make better choices when they go to the polls. This morning's forum will start out by introducing people in the room who are running for other offices besides the mayoral position, and then we'll move to the mayoral position. So we're going to start with that, with who I see. I see Larry Hug here from District 1, Quinn Adamowski from 2, I see Terry Morris from 5, and Susanna Ibarra from 5. And if I don't know you, you need to let me know if you're running for one of the other positions. Joanne Township High School, Dan Coffey. Dan Coffey from JTHS two, District 204. Anyone else? School Board, Library District, City Council? Good morning, Susanna. I'm running for Plainfield 202. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Okay. So the rules this morning are this. This is the candidates forum. We're here to get information from the candidates. We will not be challenging, fighting, or doing anything that is uncivil here. You will be cut off and asked to leave if you do. So the candidates will start in alphabetical order. Candidates will each give a prepared statement about themselves and their candidacy first. Then we'll move into some prepared questions. We'll alternate the order that people get to answer those. Following that, we'll take questions from the audience. And the way that we will get questions from the audience is by the notepads that you wrote up. So out front, there are notepads, and there will be people who have pads available here in the room if you need to, to ask a question, but you'll write down your question. And even if you put a name on it, I will mostly ask all the candidates. If it's one we've already covered, I'll say that's already been covered. We will not go through it again. So. Any questions about how we're going to proceed? Anything at all? Okay, with that then we'll get started. So we're going in alphabetical order. So the first making a prepared statement will be Ticey Bell, candidate for the mayor of the city of jo Joliet. Following her will be Terry Darcy, also running for the mayorship, and then Bob Odekirk also a candidate. So those are our three candidates for the mayoral position. So we'll start with Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell, your prepared statement to open. Yes, good morning everyone. Um, I'm happy to be here. I am uh, running, as she said, for candidacy of the Joliet mayoral office. One thing I want you all to know about me is that I am a hard worker, public servant. My 20 years plus in non-for-profit has given me the ability to serve people from a capacity of my heart and that is where I belong in this city. As a lifelong resident working with many of you in the room, I truly believe that this is an opportunity for us all to meet at an intersection where we can reset Joliet, where we can look at the priorities from a national level and on a local level have some representation in the city council office like myself. Those of you who are in the room, I want you to know one good thing too. I went to school here, I went to kindergarten here, so it feels good that you all are here and I look forward to talking to you all today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bell. Next we have Mr. Darcy. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for coming out and thank you all so much for putting this on to give us all the opportunity to get to know each other. I've been in business in Joliet for over 30 years and I've been invest investing in the Joliet community for over 30 years. My reason for seeking the Office of Mayor is to create a city that works for you. It's done neighborhood by neighborhood. With every resident equally respected, recognized, and every voice heard. Joliet is a city manager form of government, which means professionals manage our city without interference from politicians. How many city managers and police chiefs do we need to go through before we get true leadership in the city? How do we attract top talent with this revolving door we've created? When I'm knocking on doors in many neighborhoods, they tell me they don't feel safe. 
and they feel the city isn't doing enough to make them feel safe. As mayor, my first order of business will be to ensure our city focuses on public safety and quality of life for all. We need to ensure a fully staffed, well-trained, and equipped police department. Our first responders, our police officers, need to be culturally aware and sensitive to mental health issues. We have a North Point. We have new bridges. We have Rock Run at 55 and 80. Economic development for the south and east side means a grocery store. Where is your grocery store? Downtown economic development means filling the storefronts with startup businesses, minority businesses. And those startup businesses will have no better friend in City Hall because I know what it takes. I started up with a small business. It takes a vision and a plan. I love Joliet, plain and simple, but there's room for improvement. I have a vision to make our city the world-class city it can be. I'll listen and do what is best for all of us, not just those politically connected. That's how I run my business, and that's how I would govern in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Darcy. Mr. Odekirk. Thank you. Yeah, good morning, everybody. I want to thank you for coming out. Certainly thank you to the National Hookup uh, for putting this forum on. It's kind of odd that it's gone this deep into the campaign season. This is the first forum where the elected officials and the, the candidates are able to all square off and, and talk with the public. So thank you again for coming out for your interest here today. Um, very briefly, I've, I've been an elected official for 12 years in Joliet. I was elected to the uh, District 2 City Councilman 12 years ago, and then I've been the mayor for the last eight years. When I was elected in 2011 with Councilman Morris and Councilman Hug, we all were brand new city council people, the city of Joliet was facing a $27 million annual deficit. Um, I gave a speech a week ago. I went through all the numbers. I'll, I'll do, hopefully get some of that out tonight and talked about what's happened in Joliet. We have completely turned the ship around. Joliet is in better shape financially than it's ever been in any of our lifetimes. And, and, and of course, the numbers bear all that out. So I think you've had professional leadership from your elected officials, and we've shown that in, in what we've been able to do in Joliet. Um, again, I, I'm welcome to form. I'm happy for the questions to talk about what we've done moving forward. But um, I'm just very proud of the work we've done in Joliet. And of course, there's always more work to do, but our city is in great shape and there's better things to come. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Darcy. Since okay. we've started, we've had three more candidates come in who are running for office. I'm sorry, Mr. Odeker. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Bob. I certainly know who you are. Got ahead of myself. Excuse me. Judge Goodman, how are you this morning? We have Michelle Stiff, who's Joliet Township High School 204. Christopher Parker, Joliet City Council District 4. Cesar Cardenas, Joliet District 4. I thought I saw someone else come in who's running. Pat Mudron for District two. 2. 2, thank you. And Glenda McCollum for District 2. Okay. All right, so we'll start with the first question. As I said, we'll start out alphabetically, then we'll move from there. So historically, expansion has been westward focused. What are your plans to include or upgrade the east and south sides of the city? We'll start with Ms. Bell. One of my plans uh, to upgrade the east and south side of the city is to first focus on the issues that they're having when it comes to being asked uh, to move out. Right now we have a group of people who are being um, considered for a movement because of I-80. And so I want to sit down and talk to those residents first and get some insight into exactly what they're dealing with. We have another uh, opportunity on the east side and south side. Uh, we have a lot of vacant buildings. Eliza Kelly um, is no longer a community center. So I want to look at those areas. I want to work with township 
and I want to work with the people on the south side. The east side, we have an opportunity to continue to build jobs. There's a huge um, opportunity for jobs. Right now, the job issue and the homelessness is an, you can see it. Every time you ride down the street, you can see it. And so for us, I think the issue is to talk to the people, find out why when we look at grants and when we look at the funding, how that can be allocated and leveraged to build that community up. So often we just say that Joliet is looking um, bad on one side and it's been neglected. So we have city management and we do have a city government and we do have other elected officials that have put some time and effort into those plans, but they're old. So we need to figure out what's happening and why it's been neglected. We really have to look at the impact that we have and the influential people that come into this city and continue to overlook those people. Um, and so I think the first thing we need to do is look at the economic growth and development options. And when we start talking about infrastructure, we need to really think about what housing looks like, affordable housing, and who's currently working on those plans and who can continue to work with people like myself and community organizations for those that are impacted right now. Thank you. Darcy, did you need the question repeated? What's that? Would you like the question repeated? No, I'm good. Thank you. First, I'd like to speak about um, my involvement in the East Side over the years. If any of you remember Louise Ray, she and I had a meeting years ago with Reverend Singleton, and she straightened me out on how the East Side should work, and she and I were friends forever. Um, but we worked really well together, and I, I really got to understand her and the neighborhoods. Uh, some things I've done for the East Side, when we, I co-chaired a referendum in 2015 that the Park District raised 19 and a half million dollars and again we, we wanted to make sure we were equitable in that of that 19 and a half million 12.6 million dollars was used on the east and the south side a couple million in Pilcher Park 8.7 million in the Noel Park uh, Recreation Center and roughly two million dollars in 11 community parks so I'm, I'm sensitive that we need to continue to maintain our focus on all neighborhoods. You know, the one thing that I continue to hear is that, that we have a food desert here on the east and the south side. I've looked at some ideas for that, and I know that uh, we have the rooftops to do it. Aldi would be one that I would go after. There's another company called Yellow Banana. And Yellow Banana, I think, it would fit our community very well. It's uh, a retail grocery platform that owns and operates 38 stores across Cleveland, Chicago, Milwaukee, Jacksonville, Dallas. The majority of the stores are in sit and census tracts with limited, to, limited access to affordable quality food. They recognize the impact that the non-availability of nutrition has on individuals, families, and communities. They're also committed to donating a percentage of their annual profits to nonprofit organizations that address food equity issues in the United States. They source much of their inventory as possible from local and small businesses and hire local talent because they're positioned to serve the neighborhoods, friends, and families. I think to me that's one of the first things that we would want to try and address would be to get a grocery store on, on our side of town, on this side of town, among other things. Um, that, that, that was the first thought that I had. I know that we need to look at the housing uh, problem I think we have. You know, there's a lot of kids graduating from college. They, they move somewhere else because we don't have affordable housing. We've got a lot of folks that are uh, empty nesters. Where, where do empty nesters go without having to spend too much money? You know, there, there, there has to be an equitable way for someone that's raised their family to stay in the community and live safely in a good good location, good spot in their neighborhoods affordably. So those are some of the things that I would look at in that question. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Um, a couple of things. First of all, um, I agree with, with Terry. I, I knew Louise Ray on a personal basis. I was a young patrolman um, working in that neighborhood with um, so Pat Cardwell. And uh, Louise became not only a good friend of mine, but a real mentor. Um, and certainly helped me developed in my police career. She encouraged me when I went to law school, and encouraged me when I left the police department to become an attorney. So I always looked up to Miss Ray, I know her son's here today, um, and consider her a, a very important person in this community. Um, regarding the East Side, um, there's a lot to be said. And um, 
you know, I, I guess my connection with Eastside is my wife. Uh, not only did I work on the East Side as a policeman, but my wife Rebecca was born and raised on the East Side. She went to Gompers, went to A.O. Marshall and Joliet Central. My mother and father-in-law are still East Side residents, so I certainly have an affinity for this side of town. This is where I worked mostly exclusively as a police officer. Um, the development that's happened the la last year, eight years on the East Side of Joliet is more than you've seen in the last 50 years, and I'm proud of the record of what we've been able to do for these Eastside communities. Regarding the grocery store, Councilman Morris, who's standing in the back, um, and I have worked um, to get a grocery store into this neighborhood. The reality is, Certified Foods, the last several years that they were in business, they were losing a million dollars a year. And it doesn't take a businessman to know that that will not be successful. We were fortunate to have development on Jackson Street, El Guero, has purchased that certified food. The incentive package that they got from the city is the same incentive package that's being offered to any uh, grocery store that would want to locate in this neighborhood. So um, I, I'm proud of what's happened on Jackson Street, and I certainly hope that eventually someone will come forward in this neighborhood. But the idea that someone, all we have to do is call Aldi or some other company, that, that's not accurate. It's been done for years at City Hall, um, and we'll continue to do so. But it's not uh, just a matter of reaching out to a chain. Councilman Morris has reached out to numerous chains over the last couple of years to try to get a grocery store here. Um, regarding housing, I think if you look at the Water Street development, what was public housing, what Joliet Housing Authority did, in conjunction with the city, the brand new housing on Water Street. Again, that's a neighborhood that has not seen investment or new housing in many, many years. But it happened within the last eight years. I'm working, currently working with the Housing Authority about new workforce and senior housing at Joliet Country Club. There was a plan brought forward, um, the Country Club, which of course the president was Pat Mudrin when they went bankrupt. The, the new buyers brought a plan forward to develop warehousing on on the golf course. Um, and they were under the impression that it was a slam dunk, it was going to slide right through the city council. I'm not sure how, who gave them that impression, but it certainly wasn't my office or the city manager. We've denied them uh, any access to warehousing or logistics on that property. We know the roads and the infrastructure can't handle it. And quite frankly, <clears throat> we know this neighborhood would not accept that at all. So we are working with the housing authority on new housing at the golf course. Um, Joliet Prison, if you could look at the redevelopment that happened to the prison, that was a dilapidated piece of property since 2002. I think everyone here knows the story about the volunteers that have gone out there. That was my initiative after the second fire in about a month was, was lit at the prison and our firefighters were in there putting out fires. The state was not contributing. The state which owned the property was not monitoring the property. It was our fire, our policemen, which means it was your money being spent on the prison. So I think that's been a success story and I'm proud, again, to, to move that issue forward and bring new development to the east side. Um, and then I, I made an announcement last week, or last Wednesday at my speech about the U.S. Steel Mill. That's been sitting vacant since the 1980s. Working with this city manager and with executives from U.S. Steel, we are moving that site forward. It's going to be redeveloped. Governor Pritzker's office is involved in this project. Argonne National Labs is involved in this project. It's going to be a Joliet Echo Campus. It's going to be green energy, recyclable energy, green jobs for the east side of Joliet. So again, I, I think if you look at what's going on for eight years, I'm giving examples of what's happened on the east side, and compared to what happened years and years before, I don't think there's any, any um, comparison. I think what we've done for the last eight years for the east side has been tremendous, and I'm proud of the record of what we've been able to do myself and the city council. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is, what will you do to aid and support the growth of small and minority-owned businesses in Joliet? And we'll start with Mr. Darcy. We're out of order, but that's okay. I'm only kidding. Small and minority owned businesses need to be assisted by our economic development team as a resource for locations, ideas, and availabilities in the city. We as a city need to be aggressive in partnering in these endeavors. I know what it's like to be in a startup business. That's how I started. Here's what I would propose. Set aside minority contracts, if not already in place, for minority inclusion in many of the road works and things that we do. And, and maybe we have that. I, I haven't discussed that with the city. 
Uh, we did that at the tollway when I was on the tollway board years ago, and it was uh, very effective to, for bringing minority businesses into the into the fold and the money that was used to build those roads and bridges. TIF districts can help. Uh, sales tax agreements can also help uh, minority businesses and startup businesses. Those are just a few of the ideas I have. You know, we could have stipends for training to prepare people, but I, I think there could be a mentorship. When I think about years ago, Elijah Bowie had a construction company, and I know he was mentored by a few of the construction people in town, and it worked well, and we're able to get that business going. I think we need to do more and more of that type of work to help get people started in business. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, TIF districts do help, and there are a, num a number of them in Joliet right now, so um, I think uh, we, we should be educated about what we're doing in Joliet. This isn't a new idea. We're already doing that. Um, there's a special service area that was for downtown Joliet. Under my leadership, that's been extended through the Collins Street Corridor and south on Chicago Street and to the south end of Joliet. Um, again, the focus wasn't just on downtown as it had been in the past. We extended those areas to include and promote new business in other areas on the east side. And that happened after I became mayor. Um, one thing, though, that I do want to really delve into, I talked about this the other day, um, is exactly how business was done at City Hall. And I'm going to give everyone a peek behind the curtain uh, how things were done and how they're being done now. When I was elected in 2011, again with Councilman Morrison Hug, Councilman Hug made, made a, a request at a city council meeting saying this city's never had an economic development director or an economic development committee. We need an economic development committee here in Joliet. The response that Mr. Hug and the council got was, no, we don't need that. This is from Mayor Girani. We don't need a committee. We have the CARB committee. Who here knows what the CARB committee is or remembers this? If you can't, raise your hand if you remember. Councilwoman Coleman. It was called the committee to, Terry, was your hand up? I didn't see. It was called the committee to attract and retain, retain businesses. It was a private committee. No council people were on the committee. There was no council oversight. We didn't approve who was appointed to the committee. This committee did not meet in public like every other committee at City Hall. The agenda was not published. The media was not allowed at any of the meetings. It was a committee, and Mr. Darcy was a member of it, of private businessmen and the mayor. And when you talk about backroom dealing, this was the epitome of backroom dealing. Again, no oversight from the public or any elected officials. That isn't the case anymore. I, there is no CARB committee. I have no secret committees. I don't meet in private with anyone. We have established an economic development committee. We have an economic development director. The results speak for themselves. You can look at the record of what's been done the last eight years in Joliet. But I think that's one of the major changes that I made internally about the way city government works. And quite frankly, it's, it's going to work fair and work better for everyone, not just for the select few who get invited to the table. So I'm proud, again, of that accomplishment. I'm proud that everything is transparent and being done publicly. And I think clearly, look at the last eight years, the development in Joliet and the growth versus the eight years before. And I think it's clear that we are on the right path. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bell. Thank you. Um, I want to start by asking how many members are here from the African American Business Association? Wonderful, wonderful. They put this on um, in partnership, and then we have some members from the Latino Economic Development. Um, it, are you out here too? I see a few of you, right? So one thing I want to uh, point out is that when you start talking about minority businesses, you have to have them at the table. Um, too often, again, our relationships um, kind of just become a job, right? We volunteer, we serve on this board, we, we actively have a role in this organization. Every organization that put this on today, um, I've been an active member at some capacity, right? And understanding that that still leaves out a large group of people who live in the city. There are 149,000 people here, 88,000 of which are registered voters. So when we're talking about this campaign and who um, actually has a voice, it's those people that are unregistered, it's those people that are not sitting in these rooms, and recently, I've 
Obama did a uh, str strategic uh, plan, and I had an opportunity to be a part of that during the uh, COVID. We took time out and we met at one of the local churches. Since then, um, that organization um, has been able to change exactly what the face of minority businesses look like. Um, because of the Joliet Chamber's guidance, they were able to separate and function on their own. And that doesn't happen unless you do something like a SWOT analysis, unless you actually talk to the people. And so during that time, there were small groups that got together and even had um, a community table on the second time. So I think what's important to me is that we take those plans, we bring them to City Hall. As they said, work has been done, but in order to project the future, we need to have the future at the table. So we need to double down on our youth, those that are 20 that have businesses. There are some young people that also have businesses and aspire to be business leaders. One of the things that I'm working on now is a six month incubator. I've been talking to a group um, that works with SCORE and then eventually thinking about a women's um, empowerment group that would eventually become a women's chamber. So um, the last thing I would say is that there's also uh, sometimes a strategy to bringing money into communities. You see a lot of festivals downtown. Um, a lot of those can have a structure built in where there's fundraising, which allows the capability of that money to come back into those small businesses, and we can learn to do some of those things. So I think it's a mixture of um, not hearing from people and thinking that there's favoritism, nepotism, but because when it comes to building back the community, we definitely have to have them in the room. So I just wanted to share that with you all. Thank you. The next question is, we know that there are a lot of people in our area who are housing challenged, who do not have resources. What will you do to ensure that residents with housing challenges have access to resources? Thank you, Denise. Well, I, I can tell you what we have done. We've worked with the county, and quite frankly, I've worked with you, Denise, on this over the years. Um, when COVID hit in, in March of 2020, there, obviously there was concerns. No one knew the extent of this, how bad this was going to be. Um, there became a real push within the city city government and county government township government to get homeless people off of the streets give them vouchers again with the idea that they're not going to be incubators or help spread this disease so that was an emergency situation but it's something that we did at city hall we worked extensively trying to keep people safe um, as far as housing moving forward, I, I've talked already about working with the Joliet Housing Authority of the ongoing work we've, we've identified, of course, the Country Club, who they're, which they're trying to purchase. We're seeing housing, public housing been torn down and redeveloped throughout Joliet. We've identified other properties for workforce housing that we need within Joliet. Um, one of the issues I've had, and, and Denise, I has a little bit on this, it has to do with the homeless shelters um, and that type of housing in Joliet. First of all, I can tell you as we sit here today, there are open beds inside our homeless shelters. If you see individuals on the streets of Joliet, it's because they aren't following the rules and they've been thrown out of the homeless shelter or they're mentally ill and do not know how to follow the rules or they want to use drugs or alcohol and not be allowed inside the homeless shelter. But there are beds available. One issue that I've had, and I, quite frankly, I think the city council has agreed with me, is in this entire county, Will County goes from Naperville all the way to the Indiana border. There are two homeless shelters in the entire county, both on the east side of Joliet, within a mile, less than a mile of each other. I do not understand why, I understand why a county board member from Naperville would be okay with that. I don't know why a county board member from Joliet would be okay with that. The city council's not. It's time for the rest of the county to start sharing this burden. And when I say burden, understand what I mean. Every night, there are calls for fire or police service from daybreak or morning star every night. Our ambulances are transporting people to Silver Cross or St. Joe's. That's an ambulance that's not available in your neighborhood. If one of your family members is having a heart attack, a paramedic has to come from somewhere else in Joliet because the Joliet ambulance is dealing with a homeless person or an issue at the shelter. It's the same thing with the police. The city of Joliet doesn't get compensated for any of this, not from the county, not from the state, not from the federal government. So I have been somewhat outspoken um, about the burden being shifted and not just being a Joliet only burden when it comes to these types of houses, housing issues or programs, it needs to be spread out throughout the county. And I think that's one thing the city council, I think we've been uh, united on that front, that our city does 
more than the rest of Will County put together. It's time for the good people in other communities to share in that burden and share what, what we're already doing here in Joliet. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bell? So I recently had an opportunity to um, talk to the Illinois Realtors Association, as many of us may have. And one of the things that I proposed was a co-op. When we think about um, the immigrants and the individuals who live in our city, a lot of them are unhoused. When we think about a lot of the development and infrastructure changes that are happening, um, as I mentioned, um, there are a few groups that are working with the loves uh, if that's coming into the east side of Joliet, right? So I think I looked recently and there's about 170,000 people that currently have homes, right? And then we think about Joliet again and people are about one paycheck away from losing their homes. Um, mental health is definitely an indicator of uh, what can happen when people lose a job been through COVID. So a lot of these factors are like a domino effect. And I think the opportunity that we have here is to look at new developments and opportunities um, when it comes to how do we again build, how do we find the funding, how do we talk to one another about small groups of people getting together, purchasing property. It's not unheard of. These are things again that we have to move forward on with the capacity of the people. Um, one thing that I think about co-ops too is that the funding, the banking, the banking system. Um, there, there there's, there's a lot of things that we don't consider um, when it comes to institutional racism and, and these things that have happened for years. So again, we're talking about systematic change. We're talking about changing the mindset of people who currently have seen their own families for decades go through homelessness or not having food or not living in the best suitable houses or being provided opportunities to have affordable housing. So I think again, there has to be another way to impact the infrastructure in Joliet by not just tearing down those buildings Sometimes when buildings come down, so do people's morale. And so we have to again look at health care and the overall 360 structure. We are in a reset, we are in a place where nationally there are things happening in other places and there may be a lot of movement in Joliet, but it's not moving people. Um, I recently saw my cousin, it's not moving people into houses, excuse me. I recently saw a cousin of mine and um, he said that it cost him $3 to stay in one of the facilities in Joliet and that he couldn't come in unless it was below 29 degrees. So I think sometimes it's easy for you know someone like me to sit here and give you like this layout and plan, but the impact again that um, our agencies are hearing and seeing a lot of times again these folks don't have a job and so when they're asked to go out and look for a job transportation again is another issue they can't get to the job and so again we have businesses that come in and say i'm offering jobs i'm offering jobs and we assume that these people just don't want them well they can't get to them or again there's a, another barrier which ends up being um that you can't get the job if you don't have an ID. You can't have the job if you're not able to come to a staffing agency. And we know what happens when we have sta staffing agencies, right? There again, there's no protection for that individual. So again, down to the core of things, I think we have to look at the ways that we can rebuild together. And it comes down to working with the realtors, working with those who have new visions and innovation, innovative ideas to help us get to the next level in the next probably 10 years. So it's gonna take some work, but I think we can do it together when we look at who's here and identify the people who are in need and prioritize those. Thank you. I, I think that uh, one of the first things that I continue to say we need in this city is a long-term comprehensive plan. We only have so much canvas left to paint on in this community, our 68 square miles. And we need to make sure that we plant the right trees today. There's an old saying that the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. And I know that uh, I know what the mayor is talking about with regard to the Joliet Country Club property, but I can tell you this, the city has not been working hard to get that project done. I know that for a fact. I looked at that program and I think it's a wonderful program. And I know they're a few dollars apart from getting that put together, and I know the city has a bunch of money in the bank, why don't we invest in something like that that would get that jump started? There's, there's room on that property for a grocery store. There would be enough rooftops and lives, and, and it would start doing that. You know, we just zoned some light industrial property right across the street from that. 
is that the best use of that canvas if we want to continue to grow that neighborhood? While I was on the tollway board, I know that we understood that our country is growing at the clip of about 1% a year. We need to make sure that we've got the ability to grow inside that, inside our community. So if we continue to put industrial and you know, buildings like that up, where are we going to go with housing? Where are the best spaces for that? So, and, and I agree with Ticey, you know, the banks have programs that can help first-time buyers. I think we really need to address that. I think that, that country club project should be up and running right now, but it's not. I think we should get more aggressive on that. And then we really got to make sure that we know what we're doing with what we have left to work with that's not built on in our community and make sure that everybody's aware of what we're doing all the time and we make it the best we can. Thank you. The next question. We know that District 86 schools have a lot of need for upgrades, refurbishments, and whatever. So what will you do to ensure children get the resources they need to be successful? Because we do understand that if they don't get the start there, it's hard for them to improve and then through that to be able to support and upgrade the communities. So we'll start with, I'm going to start with you last. So, you next. I, I met with the superintendent of District 86 along with the committee that's working right now to put together a referendum that for, for promoting the referendum that they have right now to build two new schools, two new junior highs. I'm all in for that. It will not raise the taxes of our taxpayers. Everybody is, is struggling with our taxes, but there's nothing more important than the children of our communities. This referendum will not change anybody's taxes. Their tax bill will not change. And one of the things that I got out of that also is that the maintenance to keep these schools that they're going to replace up will then be able to flow from their budget to the schools that need more upgrading. And it will continue to evolve into some of the other buildings that need upgrading. But there is nothing more important to our future than our children. And I don't think we can afford not to have this referendum get through. And we really, really need these two schools to be replaced. They're older than I am, or they're pretty much the same age as me. That's pretty bad. But I, I really think it, it's something that we all need to embrace because there's nothing more important than the children of our community. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, of course, I agree with Mr. Darcy. There are no, there's nothing more important than the children. I think it's a good question, though. Thank you, Denise, because I think um, this is important. And these lines get blurred a lot. The city of Joliet does not manage Joliet Grammar Schools. That's, that's the, the job of the District 86 elected officials, the people that you elect. It's not the city's business to tell other elected officials how to handle their business. If there's a problem there, then that's certainly it's up to you to make the changes. But I think our school boards are doing a great job. Um, quick aside, coming out of COVID, we all saw what a tough year it was in Joliet schools last year, especially the high schools. There were 12 suicides in Joliet area schools last year. It's an astounding number. It's, it, it's, and I know that's not the question, but um, I want to compliment the officials at District 86 and 204 for what a great job they've done through this horrible period of our country and getting our young people back on track. Um, I also work with District 86 and 204 officials, and if, if they ask for support of a referendum, I'm certain myself and the city would do so. Um, and our police work directly with officials from those schools, but that's the level of the city's involvement. And, and I, I think it's important to understand what city government does. And quite frankly, I think the last answer was a little telling that maybe there isn't a real understanding of what the role is of city of Joliet government or the Joliet mayor. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Can you repeat the question again? Sure. Understanding the challenges we have in District 86 schools, what will you do to support these children of the district, make sure they get the resources that they need? All right. Um, I went to District 86 schools. Um, I definitely support the local school district, Dr. Rouse, and all those who worked on the current referendum. Uh, the first thing I want to do is make sure um, that the people in the city know 
um, what's what this referendum stands for. I think again, a lot of times we believe that the communication um, comes from City Hall and the elected officials, District 86, and people that we just see. But a lot of these families, right, whose children go to these schools, we need their support. We need to have those conversations. We we need to make sure that they understand what's going to happen during that process and what that process looks like. So I think one of the things I would do to support that is host a town hall with the families in those neighborhoods with those families that may or may not have an opportunity to understand what those next steps are and so that they don't feel like again as I always say that someone is building things around them and not building them up I want to make sure that they feel empowered to speak their truth about what's happening at the school and that may again give us an opportunity to support their needs and evaluate what's currently happening at the school at that level so I definitely support the current referendum thank you so we'll keep the Michaels we'll start with you this time so what plans do you have for the renovation, redevelopment, changes to the downtown area? All right. So um, I think one of the things um, that we've seen is that there have been plans um, dating back for years of things to come and, you know, kind of waiting to see what's going to happen down there. And so the current plan, um, I've seen it. I know that the concerns um, with one of the groups I work with is that it, it, it boasts of having um, a water, an, a, a larger scale of water being um, used up. And so while I think that the project is beautiful and it's a beautification of the city, I talked to a constituent recently and they said, why do we keep fixing up downtown and not fixing up the things that are around it? Why do we keep trying to attract people to the downtown and we don't have restaurants that reflect the people in the city? So again, when we talk about minority businesses, um, I know we have a few new one Richardson's. I have not yet to get there, but I know that there was an, e uh, an event hosted there. But again, you know, when you think about what downtown looks like and what it boasts of, the festivals are great, but again, we leave out a couple of groups that don't have an opportunity to participate in those festivals. So I think people want to see a good downtown, but I also think that they don't want to see all of the hurt, the pain, the old, what was there, and then just another rebuild, and then there's nothing again that speaks to the people um, that actually live in the city. And so um, while I do, again, think that um, we have new residents, I have some friends that live on Chicago Street, I think that those are all great things. Things. When the money came through from the city center partnership and they offered um, funding for those who were going to do modernization to businesses, a few of those businesses have already came and left. Um, I know that there was a young woman who has a daycare center and um, she recently had went to the city because she wanted to relocate her business to the other side and she was told that no, it's an entertainment district. So I think again we have a lot of different reasons for doing things and then we have a lot of vacancies and then we have a lot of people who are being told that no, this area isn't for you, it's for this group or that group. So um, I would definitely love to see us um, build up the economy everywhere um, because we know that the downtown area is a TIF district and there's some reasoning um, behind that. I'm also working on the local project um, well, so in support of, I've been kind of busy lately, but the um, Will County Courthouse and, and, and keeping that project alive. One of the plans that I presented to that group was that we have a business incubator, that we have a spot for um, um, events like this where we can be in a civic center of some sort so I think that you know again next door to us Neighborville Aurora places like that the, it, it, those cities boast of opportunities and it looks good and we usually leave Joliet to spend our money in their downtown area so what can we do that really reflects the people and what we want in our downtown and I think again that is businesses but also looking at the infrastructure that's currently down there that does not reflect the city that we have and its citizens Thank you. Well, we have been uh, waiting for five years to get the uh, downtown plaza ready across from the Rialto. You know, we've had several years of um, festivals down there. I think that the idea of a festival is to bring people downtown. Years ago, I was asked if I would help invest in a Star Wars program to come downtown. Well, the Star Wars is a big thing now. I was asked by the chamber if I thought it was a good idea to have New Orleans North. Let's do it downtown. I, I helped invest in that. We, I was part of the family fiesta that we did at, uh, at, at across the river at Bicentennial Park. It was so crowded and busy. I said, let's move it across. Let's bring it downtown. The only way to get people downtown is to get people downtown. 
So we've been waiting a long time. I know right now, I believe we have a committee going right now that, that's going to start to look at how to best use that space that's been a parking lot for five years. We owned it for seven years. I think that's the beginning. That, that's the, the light that turns on to get the city moving again. And I think, you know, along with that, we need to redevelop the section of Chicago Street that hasn't been redone in a long, long time. We, we connected it now so you can come in off 80 and come right in downtown. You know, I, I go to other cities and they've got soft curbs and in the summer they have the restaurants that put little fences outside and people are sitting along the sidewalk enjoying the outdoors. I just got back from a meeting in Dallas. You know, they had a city center. They have, they have artificial grass and people out there, you know, tumbling around and having fun. And, and it's all part of a city center. We, we can do that. Another thing I know that's, that's really big and that's been on my mind for a long, long time, I'd love to see us get student housing downtown Joliet, you know, where there are children and kids, their parents come and other people come, they bring life. I know for a fact, I sat on the University of St. Francis board for a number of years, I know for a fact that they have been wanting to work with the city to get student housing. They don't want more student housing on their campus. They'd like to get student housing downtown. And again, that will bring people, energy, and life to the downtown. I, I you know, the old courthouse, that's part of the campus of Joliet's downtown. And, and I, with all due respect to the county, I think the city should be working together with the county to decide what are we gonna do with that piece of property in Joliet's downtown. I understand it's owned by the county and controlled by the county. And I understand there are deed restrictions on that, but I really believe that we as a city should be working in unison with the county to make sure that we end up with the best use of that property. Um, we, need a, we need a catalytic project downtown. I know some years ago there was a, an idea to bring a, a large hotel and a conference center downtown. It was gonna connect to Harris. But in the meantime, a guy came along and he bought the old Barrett's building. He said, well, I'm gonna put a, I'm gonna put a hotel up here. Well, that hotel hasn't ever gone up. The conference center project got put to the wayside because it might have interfered with that project. So, you know, another thing that we could use is something like that. I, I think, Denise, you hosted something for oh, several counties around the country, but we didn't have anywhere to host that. You know, that would be something that I think would really be bring something downtown. We missed out on something called the River's Edge tax credit that some of the other cities have used that are along the rivers that 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 was a tax incentive that was put out there to bring business to downtowns and areas that are needing some help we didn't get involved in that so we missed out on that particular opportunity to get some grant money so those those are some of the thoughts i have on what we have to do to get downtown going is get people back down there and i think student housing would be the beginning of that i think get that plaza redone. I think that we could have more and more festivals downtown. There's so many things we can do and I think that's what city centers are all about. Get people down, enjoy our community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's probably good that I'm answering last because I could probably clear some things up on a number of these issues. Number one, the old courthouse. Um, Terry's right, that is owned by the county and the Will County Board, as the East goes, has already voted to demolish the courthouse. Um, they didn't consult with the city of Joliet. That was their decision, their choice. And Governor Pritzker's capital bill, the bill that's bringing $1.4 billion to I-80, um, including that bill was a million dollars to tear down the courthouse. So those decisions have been made. If the county wants to backtrack on it, certainly the city will work with them as we have on, on other projects, which I'm gonna mention in a minute here. Um, you've seen downtown in the last eight years a new train station. You've seen the new bus terminal. These are monumental projects that have come forward. Um, both of those began the, before I was mayor, so I'm, I'm not going to say my administration should take credit, but I was a city councilman for both of those, um, and we, we worked um, in conjunction with the state and local governments to get th those projects done. Um, regarding Chicago Street reopening, um, well, I, I guess I'll, I'll talk about the courthouse. When I was a city councilman, I'm an attorney, and I had people from the county board reached out to me and said the city of Joliet was refusing to participate in any of the conversations the county was having about building a new courthouse. Um, and there was concern, Republicans controlled the county board at the time, and they were bent, there were no Republican represent, representatives in Joliet, of moving the courthouse outside of downtown Joliet, 
They had selected the site at 355 um, and, and Route 6 where Silver Cross Hospital is. They wanted to build new, they wanted to get it out of Joliet for people from the rest of the county not to have to come into downtown Joliet. When I became mayor, the first thing I did was reach out to Larry Walsh and Nick Palmer and reach out to Republicans, get them in a room and said, we're gonna work out a deal, we're gonna keep the courthouse in downtown Joliet. That was my initiative. It took three meetings, but a deal was struck. The city's involved in that deal and you, the new construction occurred. The courthouse stayed in downtown Joliet. Following that, myself and the county executive, Larry Walsh, worked on, it was like a monopoly game, exchange of properties in downtown Joliet. Part of it was the parking lot to the east of the courthouse, which eventually reopened Chicago Street. Part of it was the building um, across the street from the Rialto, the old um, state's attorney's office and the old bank that subsequently been turned down. The plan was to reopen Chicago Street, which we did. Denise, you were there with me that day when we did the ribbon cutting. We have reopened Chicago Street. We, we have begun the rescaping of Chicago Street. And the downtown plaza, it's, there's not a committee that's been formed. This project is moving forward. There's going to be a public forum, I think, next week at the library looking for public impact. But it's not at a committee level. This project had begun three years ago or three and a half years ago when the pandemic hit and the state ordered all businesses closed. Things like pursuing a downtown um, city center were put on hold for obvious reasons. The city of Joliet was facing a complete cut off, the spigot was turned off of all sales tax revenue. So we knew internally, we, we had no idea how long in March of 2020, how long this was going to last. We didn't know what, what this is going to look like on the back end. What we knew is that we cannot be allowed to fail. City government cannot fail. I said that many times. I was doing daily press conferences during those first month and a half of COVID, giving people information. But the services we provide from the city of Joliet, the police service, the fire service, your streets, and your water. Those are essential items that the people of Joliet need. So it's true that, that, that the downtown plaza was put on hold. It was the wise choice to make, to spend money frivolously or spend millions of dollars redoing streets when we weren't sure if we were going to have to lay employees off or we weren't sure what was going to happen if 50 police officers get COVID or three fire stations all get in and pass COVID around. That was the decision making and I don't regret it all. It was responsible. We did the right thing. Um, a couple of the other things. There's talks about festivals downtown. Those have expanded the last eight years. I, I love them. I love the festivals. I love all of them. But there's a story I want to tell today, and Miss Julie Alexander is here. She knows the story. After the Fiesta in Lake Cali came in, I don't know if I'm saying it right. I never pronounce it right, but um, Caesar, did I say that right? Thank you. Um, that was a Spanish festival, and tremendous, tremendous. Um, Results: eight to 10,000 people in downtown. I had elected officials from Aurora uh, come to me one day, say, we don't have this in Aurora. How did you do this in Joliet? Um, so it was a great, as all the festivals, great turnout, great local support. And Miss Julia came in with a group of other African-Americans, said, you know, Mayor, you have New Orleans North, you have Kids Fest, you have this fiesta now. What about our, our people? Where, what about a festival for African-Americans in Joliet? And the approach I took is, is, is the same approach that I love taking when people come in. I said, look, I'm all for it. I, I agree. We will help you. We'll work with you. You put it together, and, and we will do everything we can. We'll help with the sponsorships. We'll help with the city center partnership, the Chamber of Commerce. We'll throw the weight of the city behind it, our police, our inspectors, everything. And that turned into the Including You Fest, which is a great annual event. I give a lot of credit, and not just because you're here, Miss Julia, but you know, you and your group, that you, you challenged me, I challenged you back, and you stepped up and you made it happen. There was talk earlier about those festivals giving money, scholarships, or giving money back to the community. That's what your festival does every year. So that's just an example. But um, again, the things that are being mentioned, these things are happening and have happened. And I'm proud that they've, ha that they've happened in downtown. Um, there are a number of new businesses that continue to come. Uh, there is a hotel being planned on Ottawa Street. Um, I'll, I'll just leave it, I'll cut my answer off here. As far as new housing and youthful housing, I agree. I think we all know, where we're all of a certain age, if you could get young girls to come, the young guys are gonna follow, right? And that's what the, the goal would be for downtown. Um, University of St. Francis and Joliet Junior College have both identified buildings downtown where they would like to reinvest and build new dorms for their students. Um, there's a housing authority property on Ottawa Street that the housing authority, if they could finalize the purchase 
of the country club are, is going to look to sell to one of those two colleges. So I, I agree that getting younger people in the downtown is the answer moving forward. And those plans are in the works, again, not only from the city, but from other entities like the Joliet Housing Authority that is looking to sell properties to the two colleges. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be coming right back there. Just want to remind people that if you have questions in the audience, you need to fill out one of the sheets and pass it to one of the workers around the room. Workers, raise your hands so they know who to give them to so that we can get your questions included if they haven't already been asked. Thank you. So back to you, Mayor Odekirk. Uh, we know that there have been incidences of police brutality in the Joliet community. How will officers be held accountable for not following proper protocol and procedures? Well, I 